I want to read you verses 1 through 10. We're going to be going through verses 1 through 26, but to set up the story, let me read through verse 10. It says in verse 1, Now Jesus, learning that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although it in fact was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Here's the key verse I want you to underline, highlight, circle, mark it up in your Bible if you can. Now he had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. Verse 5, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey. Anybody tired this morning? Anybody feeling weary, exhausted, just I'm out of the game, I'm, I'm tired? Jesus knows how you feel. It says he was tired from the journey. And he sat down by the well. It was about noon. Verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to drink water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? In parentheses, my Bible says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God, And who it is that asks you for a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. It's not what you think. In fact, I preached a sermon in the beginning of this stay-at-home, shelter-in-place season called It's Not What You Think. And so I was going to title this sermon, It's Not What You Think. But then I realized I already titled the sermon, It's Not What You Think. And then I realized there's so many messages and passages that I'm going to ruin for you. I need to just turn, to, I need to title a series, It's Not What You Think, so I can mess up all these passages for you. But here's the title of my sermon for you today. And I believe it's what Jesus is telling this Samaritan woman. It's what I want to tell you today and wherever you're at and whatever you're struggling with in your life this morning, I want you to hear me. There's more to the story. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, there's more to the story. Put it in the chat. There's more to the story. Find your seat. Let's get into this word as we seek God's wisdom for us today. There's more to the story. You know, it's been a crazy two weeks. It's been a crazy year. And uh, June is usually the month where my wife and I, we take off for the month of June. It's six months into the year. We've had the opening of the year. We've had our uh, church anniversary. We've had Easter. We've had all of these things in between. And by June, we're really tired. And so it is in the best interest of, your, of the church, of you, for us to take a break and to take a sabbatical, to take a rest. Unfortunately, uh, this whole 2020 season has really not allowed us to do that. And so uh, it's been uh, an adjustment for us to figure out how do we navigate through this. And, you know, we're, we're looking to the future as to opening up soon and getting ready to get people here in this church building and uh, really excited about the future of what God is going to do here. But uh, we celebrated our first year of marriage last week. And so we decided, you know what, after Sunday, we, we got done with church and uh, I preached the 930 so well. I was like, I don't even need to preach the 1130. Let's go. Let's drive to Tahoe. Let's take a, a weekend off. And so we drove down to Tahoe and got a hotel and went down by the lake beach and just tried to relax. That was really, really hard to do last week because that was a time when all of this stuff was really starting to hit. And, uh, and although we were out of town, our hearts were in Sacramento. And there were uh, protests happening in our city, and there was things happening in our community. And so it was so hard for us to disconnect from uh, the stuff that was happening at home because that's where our heart is, you know, the people that we love, the community that we care for. And so uh, although we were away, we spent a lot of time like this. Probably me more than my wife. I had to pay for that later. But spent a lot of time on this thing, looking at live feeds and, you know, seeing updates. And uh, was so grateful that even in that time, our, our church came together and uh, went downtown to Sacramento and started helping just to serve our community in such a difficult and challenging time. But, but it was tough to disconnect. And so one of the mornings I woke up and I said, okay, God, I, I need to spend some time with you. I need to recalibrate my mind. And so I went out to the little porch and we had a little patio and there was some grass and there was a beautiful uh, sight of the lake. And, and I was sitting out there and I said, God, I need you to speak to me. 
Anybody ha- said that to God anytime recently? Oh, God, I need you to speak to me right now. And so I'm sitting there, and, and immediately, God's so faithful. Uh, he started speaking to me as I was looking out. And right in front of me, there was this patch of grass. And uh, in front of me, there was this grass that it was about 9 o'clock in the morning that still had the morning dew on the blades. You ever woken up and see that, this, the moisture that's still beating at the end of the blades of grass? And I was looking at it, so beautiful, so delicate, looking at these blades of grass and how the moisture was slowly being soaked into the soil. As I looked at this grass, it was lush, it was green, it was growing, it was, it was beautiful. And, uh, and then I, I looked a little bit further, just a few feet further from this patch of grass in the same field, uh, and this grass just a few feet further um, didn't have the dew on it anymore. In fact, it was dried up, and the grass was a little bit of a different color than the gra- grass that was closer to me. It had a little bit more of a yellow tint to it. It, was, it looked like it was fighting the hot Tahoe sun. And it was so interesting because as I looked at these two sections of the same patch of grass, they looked so different. Yet they had the same experience. Both of them had the morning dew. Both of them were in the same vicinity, in the same area, yet they had such a different reality. And the Lord began to speak to me and reveal to me how sometimes when we look at something face value, it's so difficult for us to understand that somebody so close to us could have such a different reality than ours. What I began to realize was as I was looking at this grass, the grass that was closest to me that was lush and green and still had the dew upon it, it was in the shade. It was covered by a structure that had been built to guard it from the harshness of the sun, to keep it from being scorched so that it had the privilege for this water and this moisture to slowly soak into the ground so it could grow. And yet this grass that was just a few feet further away, was out of the line of this structure in the sunlight from the beginning of the morning. And although it had the dew and although it had the opportunity, it was further away from a structure that was built so that it didn't receive the shade. In fact, it started to get scorched over time and it was dried out and it was discolored. Two sections of the same patch of grass in such a different reality. What I realized was that in this moment, God was giving me a 360 perspective to realize that sometimes there's more to the story. And there's something that you can't see when you're just looking at something at face value. But the grass that was closest to me was the grass that was shaded by a structure built in order to protect it. I was thinking about that this week because we've been dealing with this issue of racism and prejudice, and I wonder, have been wondering why it's so challenging for some of us to realize that this is a reality for some people in our community. Because when we look at our lives, we see lush green grass with dew that's soaking in and moisture, but maybe we don't realize that there's more to the story. And maybe there's a reality that God wants to give us that goes beyond what we see and experience, but, but has 360 perspective. I believe that's what God wants to do for us today. I believe God wants to elevate our vision and give us 360 perspective to recognize that sometimes there are things that I don't see and there's a perspective that I need to get. And I know that you're thinking this this morning, especially for my white friends, you're thinking, there's no way, pastor, I am not racist. And I, I feel you. I have those same, same thoughts at times. I, I, there's no way that I could struggle with any of this. But I love what the psalmist says. You see, the psalmist understood that sometimes, even though I look into my heart, there are things that I can't see. We call these blind spots. And in Psalm 139, the psalmist ends his writing by saying this, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. What's he saying? There may be things in me that I don't see. There may be more to the story. And here's what I want you to understand today is that you can be redeemed and still struggle with racism. And I come to you with a humble heart today. I I, I really believe that I'm here more to, 
teach to you and, and to share maybe a different perspective. Because here's the reality. Regardless of where you come from or what you believe, racism is wrong. It's a sin. It's evil. But it's been around for a long time. In fact, we see racism in the story of Jonah, a prophet of God, a man of God called to preach. And the Bible says that he was called to go to the city of Nineveh. If you don't know anything about Nineveh, it was a Gentile city, meaning it wasn't a Jewish city. And Jonah was responsible to go preach the gospel to the Ninevites. And here's what he knew. If I preach to them, they'll repent. And I don't want to see these Gentiles be raised up, reconciled to God. And so I'm going to run from this calling. Yet he was a prophet of God, and he's in the scriptures. You can be saved and still struggle with some sin in your life. We see it in the story of the Good Samaritan. We see it in Peter. Paul confronts Peter in Galatians 2 saying, you're a hypocrite. You you say one thing, but then you do the other. And and this needs to be dealt with. And so it needs to be a responsibility of us as believers. The Bible says in Romans 12, love must be sincere. And it gives a definition for sincere love. It says, cling to what is good, but hate what is evil. We've got to get the record straight, and we've got to be willing to ask God to reveal some things in our hearts. But here's what I've learned about Scripture, and I've been in church my whole life. I can tell you that sometimes we even use Scripture as a way to reinforce some ugly beliefs that we have. And what we don't. Maybe there's more to the story. I want to start in verse 1. Let's go back to the beginning. It says, now Jesus, in John chapter 4, learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was in fact that Jesus, it wasn't him who was baptizing, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Here's the key scripture, verse 4. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. Now, if you don't know anything about Samaria or Samaritans, in scriptural context and historical understanding, this environment is already uncomfortable. Jesus is tired. He's been working hard, and he's on a direct route to get to Galilee. And the most direct route to get to Galilee, you got to pass through Samaria. And Samaria was not a city that any Jew wanted to be seen in. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Here's why. The Jewish people believed that Samaritans were half-breeds. That's the words that they would use. They came from one nation, and they mixed with another nation. And because they were half-breeds, they weren't real Jews. I hope you can read in between the lines today. They hated each other. It, it It was a... Not only a rough relationship between the two, it was a a, a situation and a circumstance of racism and bigotry. They had nothing to do with each other. That's why the story of the Good Samaritan is so potent, because, because Samaritans to the Jews were the last type of people they wanted to mix with on the planet. And the Bible says to get to Galilee, Jesus is tired, yet he has to go right through Samaria to get there. I think that for us to get to God's calling in our lives, we've got to be willing to get out of our comforts. We have to be willing, if we're going to go to the place that God has destined us to go, we've got to realize that the only way to get there is to go through Samaria. We've got to be willing to leave where we are, to go to a place out of our comfort zone, to maybe understand that there's more to the story. My question for you today is, when was the last time you left where you've been to go to a place where somebody else's reality differs from yours? When have you gone to them? Are you willing to go to Samaria? You see, I believe that we're in a season of awakening right now. And I know you may not be able to see it. I know you may not feel it, but I I sense it in my spirit. We are in a season of awakening. I believe we're awakening to reform. I believe change is on the horizon. I believe we're about to see some radical change in our nation. I believe we're seeing an awakening in relationships. People are connecting beyond culture and background. They're realizing, man, I got to learn from you because there's some blind spots in my life. 
We're awakening to revival. We're awakening to new information. We're awakening to God's move. I don't know if you know this, but last weekend we celebrated Pentecost Sunday. And the beauty of Pentecost Sunday is that it was a move of the Spirit. And when I track that back in recent years to the Azusa Street Revival, the Azusa Street Revival was birthed out of racial tension. And there was a man named William Seymour, a black man who decided that this gospel and this move of the Spirit is not just reserved for one type of person. It's for everybody. And a move of the Spirit broke out that we're still living in that revival now. I believe there's an awakening on the horizon. My question is, can you see it? And maybe you can't see it because you haven't stepped into Samaria. All you see is your immediate circumstances. It goes on in verse 5. It says, he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near a plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now, the writer is informing the reader that where he's at has historical significance to the Jewish people. Jacob, his well was there, and this plot of ground he'd given to his son Joseph. Jesus was tired, and he sat down by the well. It was about noon, verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to drink water, and Jesus said, will you give me a drink? Immediately, as the reader is hearing this story, is turned off. Because here's what the writer does. The writer sets up the story to be something that they connect with, they have expectation from. Have you ever started a movie because somebody told you it was great and you had all these expectations of what it was going to be, and like 10 minutes into the movie, you're like, what were you talking about? I- I don't see it. I, I, I'm the let down expectations. The, the, the Jewish people, they're listening, and they hear the historical connection. This is Jacob's plot of land. He gave it to his son, Joseph, our people. This is our land. And then it says, and a Samaritan woman came by. Immediately, they turn it off. You got to be kidding me, John. Come on. You're going to ruin the story like this? They're, they're expecting a meat cute. You know what a meat cute is? I was telling my mom about the sermon yesterday. She said, she stopped me in my flow. She's like, Jared, I don't know what a meet cute is. Explain. A meet cute is in the movie when a guy and a girl are walking down the street and they bump into each other. The coffee spills over, but they don't care because they're looking at each other like, oh my gosh, this was fate. <laughs> because here's what we know about the well is when the well is mentioned, it reminds the Jewish people of a story of Jacob's lineage. Isaac had a servant who found his wife at the well. You remember this? It's all, the historical context is all together, and so they're expecting for this meet cute to happen. They're expecting, because in the story of Isaac finding his wife, Rebecca, here's what he was looking for. He was looking for somebody that was of his same culture. He didn't want to marry a Canaanite woman. And so they looked out to find a woman in his same lineage, in his same culture. And Rebecca shows up and it's this amazing moment. Finally, somebody who looks like me. And so they're expecting the similar story. And all of a sudden, the writer throws it off and says a Samaritan woman shows up and derails the story away from what they were looking forward to. But here's why. Jesus wasn't looking for a meet cute. He was looking for a miracle. I think sometimes we miss out on the supernatural because we are unwilling to step into Samaria. We're looking for people and things that look like us. And here's the beauty of that is it makes us comfortable. But here's the downfall of that. You never grow in your comfort zone. In fact, you hardly ever grow when you're surrounded by people who look and sound like you. And it's just so easy to do that nowadays because I can control my friend list. I can control those who follow me, and I can block those who don't. And it's so easy for me just to surround myself with people who look and sound like me. The question is, is are we willing to step into Samaria? You see, relationships don't happen when we demand people to come to us. Relationships happen when we choose to leave our place of comfort to discover that maybe there's more to the story. And I think it's so easy in recent times for somebody to say something, post something, comment something that we don't like or that maybe we don't understand. Because that's what I've really noticed in my life. I usually am afraid of what I don't understand. 
And it's so easy for me to just block, delete, ignore, instead of step into Samaria. The truth is we all have a bias. And I think that that's what we need to deal with in the beginning of all of this is that we need to deal with our discomfort and our discomfort comes from our bias. We all have a bias. You know, bias is, bias is a lean, an inclination. We all have a bias that makes us comfortable because in this place, I'm comfortable. But if we're going to learn how to be unified in seasons like this, we have to deal with our discomforts. It's just so easy to block people based on my bias. My interests and my likes, and I just create this world that reflects my own ideology. The problem is you never find anything other than your own ideology. I believe God is calling us to be a people that's willing to step into Samaria and not dismiss people who look different from ourselves. You see, a lot of times we limit what we take in based upon our lean, and connection happens when I enter into Samaria, not avoid it. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. It says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness. I want you to hear these words and ask yourself, am I living in this place? Kindness, humility, gentleness. Can I talk to you for a second? Gentleness is not an effeminate trait. It's a Holy Spirit trait. In fact, it's a fruit of the Spirit. There have been times when I, I don't want to be gentle. But it says kindness, compassion, gentleness, and patience. Look at verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another if anyone has an grievance against you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Verse 14. Over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Here's the reality. We have to be willing to love one another in the midst of our differences. But is your lean keeping you from loving people? Is your bias making you block the people out in your life that God wants to use to break through some of the walls that maybe you can't see because there's more to the story? And I want to challenge you wherever you are today, when there is a voice in your life that is different from what you experience, don't shut it out because you don't understand it. Lean in so that you can grow and evolve and maybe realize that there's more to the story. We've got to put on love. You see, the scripture is our authority as believers. And I'm not coming to you as a white man today. I'm coming to you as a brother in Christ, as, as somebody who is held accountable to this same scripture. We've got to put on love. But that means we've got to deal with our discomfort. The truth is we just don't like being uncomfortable. We don't like stepping into situations that make us feel like we're not on top. Can I, can I tell you one of the things I realized this week as I was asking God, God, why is it so difficult sometimes to talk about racism, specifically in my position? I'm not looking for anybody else, but why is it difficult for me at times to talk about racism? As a white man, God, God spoke to me. He said, you know why, Jared? He said, it's because as a white man, you'll never be the expert on that topic. That means I, I can't have pride or ego. I'm going to have to ask for help, and that's hard for me to do. But i got to leave my comforts so that God can cultivate something inside of me that would bind unity in the church, bind unity amongst his people. we got to deal with our discomforts. I want to challenge you today. Don't avoid what you don't understand. Embrace it. Step into Samaria today. Step into the place that you don't understand that's uncomfortable for you so that God can reveal something. Now, let's get into the dialogue. Verse 9, it says, This Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Now, let me clarify. She says, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. She specifies because it's not just Samaritans. Samaritans were seen as down and out, disenfranchised people to the Jews. 
But a Samaritan woman is an even greater level of discrimination. Women had hardly any rights. They were treated as property. She says, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. This doesn't make any sense. And then it says in parentheses, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus asked her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, pause. I want to read this the way I read it. Can I read it the way I hear it? Because I, I got a little bit of sass. I'm Italian. We argue for sport. Okay. So when I read this, I hear it like I would say it. So let's start over. The Samaritan woman, verse 9, says, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is very deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give... I don't have to keep coming out here and get water myself. That's how I read it. I'm just being honest. That's how I read it because that's how I would say it. And I think, honestly, that's how we, we need to read the Bible with emotion because we read it just like, Ugh, but it, like there's real emotion here. These are people who did not like each other. There's attitude. There's sass. But maybe there's more to the story. And as I read this escalation, I realize it's so easy for things to escalate when you're engaging with someone who doesn't understand you. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on, somebody who got into it on Facebook this week. Somebody who got into it in the comment section this week. It's so easy for things to escalate when you're engaging with somebody who does not understand you. But I think the climate that we're in doesn't help the communication. Because even when you intend for something to sound right, I think it can sound wrong. This happened to me last week. I was scrolling through Instagram, and I'm out here, you know. I'm posting, and I'm sharing, and I'm trying to stand for when I see injustice, you know. And I'm thinking, man, I'm doing such a good job. The world so, so, should be so grateful to have me as a leader, and I'm, doing, I'm just really making a difference. And I, I, I'm, I'm looking through Instagram posts. I'm just being honest. This, this, is, the, this is the stuff we all have to struggle with because I think sometimes we put something on Instagram. We think, I did my job, and I'm doing so much. And after a while, you start feeling a little bit entitled. And, uh, and I'm scrolling through, and I see something a friend of mine posted, and I, I put something in the comment section to, to encourage. But the way that I worded it, 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 because of the climate that we're in, I think if it had been any other season, it would have been understood. But because of the climate we're in, the communication began to get corrupted. And what I thought I was saying was not heard the way that I intended it to be heard. And somebody I didn't know commented on it. And I mean, like for a book, just ripped me apart. And so I got really upset. And uh, I, I called my friend. I said, you going to do something about that? This person called me this, this, and this. You know me. We're friends. What I realized is that even he didn't understand what I was trying to say. I got mad about that. I was upset at that because nobody wants to be misunderstood. I think a lot of people are getting misunderstood in the mess that we're in right now. But here's the truth. Sometimes because of the climate, communication gets corrupted. And our hurts make it really difficult for us to hear. I've learned this in marriage, that when you're hurt, it's really hard to hear. Doesn't matter what you say, because now what you say, I'm already on the defensive. Because you've hurt me once, and I'm not going to let you hurt me again. And I think right now, in the season and the climate that we're in, so much of our communication is being corrupted because our hurt is making it really hard to hear. 
And as I look at the context of this story, the Bible says that this place that they were in was not just a place in Samaria. It was the city of Sychar. And in the city of Sychar was this well. You already heard me talk about the well, how the Jews had an expectation of what would happen at the well. But what you don't understand is that this well represented war between the Samaritans and the Jews. See, the reason why Samaritans and Jews hated each other was because from the very beginning, there was a territory war. The well that once belonged to Jacob now was in the city lines of Samaria. And the Jews believe this belongs to us. This is our history. This is our heritage. You can't take that from us. And the Samaritans said, well, this is our country too. This is our nation too. There was a territory war. And because of this well, all of this conflict started. Out of land grew racism and bigotry and hatred towards one another. And it started to teach me that something so small can turn into something so great. A little disagreement can turn into hatred for people that don't look like me. And, and it's spiraled now. It's spiraling out of control. And as I realized what was happening here, as I studied the history behind this well, I realized that sometimes as I read this scripture, I hear it, but I'm not really listening. Because when I read it, I read it like I read comments. And that's how I hear it. Well, what I don't realize is that there's an issue behind the issue. And when I hear this woman speak, I hear sass and I hear tone and I hear arguing. But maybe there's more to the story. As I studied this well, and as I studied what the woman was really doing, I realized that she actually wasn't arguing with Jesus. She was trying to understand a deeper issue. As she brings up the topic of this well, what she's saying here is this. This well is the reason we're at war. And it's taboo that we're even talking to each other right now. But if you got an answer to overcome this issue, I'm all ears. Give it to me because I'm tired of walking out here. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of arguing. If you've got an answer to this issue, I'm all ears, but I don't know what the answer is. So talk to me, Jesus. Tell me what you got because if it can keep me from having to walk out here day after day and fight for what I got, then give it to me. And I think so often we dismiss people because we think that what they're doing is arguing when what they're really doing is trying to understand the deeper issue, what's really going on. And what happens is when we see somebody we think that's arguing, we dismiss them and discard them. And maybe what you perceive as combative actually is an attempt to connect. What you see as aggression might just be desperation. And I think for us to win in this season, we've got to learn how to listen. Social media is the worst place to do this. Can I, can I be honest with you? And it's important that we post, and it's important that we take a stand. But can I just tell you, if you're not have com- having conversations deeper outside of social media, and the extent of your dialogue is happening in the comment section, you are not standing for something. You are posting something and arguing with somebody. You can't even know the tone of what they're saying. But maybe we got to learn how to listen. Because sometimes I see people who are angry, and I judge them because they look angry. But maybe it's not anger. Maybe it's just exhaustion. This isn't just how we handle the topic of racism. This is how we handle relationships in general. If you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because sometimes what seems like aggression, what seems like irritability is actually exhaustion and a desire just to be heard. Because time and time again, this person has been dismissed. When we're programmed to argue, we bypass the deeper issue. And we hear, but we don't listen. This woman was looking for freedom. 
but it doesn't look like it at face value because we're so programmed to hear her words in a certain way. My question for you is, what is getting in the way of your listening right now? Is it reading through the comments? Is it trying to have the right response? Is it proving somebody wrong? Is it proving yourself right? Is it not understanding the background? Whatever it is, we got to deal with what's getting in the way of our listening. And sometimes it's our bias. Sometimes it's our hard-heartedness. Sometimes it's just the reality that we need to look again because there's more to the story. But if you like to argue, this next part is essential for you. Because what happens, it escalates. And if you're a professional arguer, this is like knockout, KO right here. Verse 16, Jesus says, okay, go call your husband and come back. Now, y'all know this story. She says, I have no husband. So Jesus says, you're right when you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you have right now is not your husband. So what you said is true. Now, if you like to argue, this is like, boom, mic drop, you're done. But I know Jesus, and I know how he handles people. And I know that we've been taught this time and time again. But I know Jesus, and that just doesn't sound like Jesus. Jesus doesn't put people on blast, especially a woman who is the lowest of society. In fact, the fact that he's even speaking to a woman right now is illegal. Rabbis weren't allowed to speak to women. So maybe there's more to the story. And so I did some digging and I did some studying. Here's what I realized about reading this story and reading through the comments and hearing everything that's going on right now, it's really easy to believe a narrative when you feel like you already know it. The question is, are you willing to investigate? At face value, it looks like she's arguing with Jesus, so he exposes her infidelity, right? You're right. You're not married. You, got, you had five husbands, and the one you have right now, you're not even married to. Most people would say she's a prostitute, she's unfaithful, she's gone from guy to guy, and Jesus is putting her on blast so that people know, so that she knows he's got the upper hand. But here's what I started to learn about the culture and the history of that time. It was extremely, extremely difficult for women to divorce men, nearly impossible. It didn't happen much. In fact, Anytime there was a separation or a divorce, 99% of the time, it was a man divorcing a woman. There were multiple reasons for this. Usually, it was because there was something deficient in her, so he would discard her away, divorce her, and be done with it. The problem with this was that women at that time were so disenfranchised, were so at the bottom of society, they needed to be with a man to, to survive. There was no way she would be able to survive without being married. And so it was either one of two scenarios. It was either one, because if she was a prostitute, she wouldn't have been married to them. So it was one of two scenarios. Either she had been married to an older man, which is very common. Women would get married at the age of 10 to men 10 or 20 years older than them, and he would have died. So she would have had to get married over and over to provide for herself. And she just had really bad luck. Or she married a man, and he found out that she wasn't worth it, so he divorced her. Married another man to survive. He found out she wasn't worth it. He divorced her. And this happened time after time until finally she's with a guy who won't commit to her because she's not worth it. Either way, this woman had been dismissed and discarded and thrown away, and she's just trying to survive. Isn't it so funny how our bias determines how we read this story and how we see this woman? For so many years, I saw this woman as just unruly, just angry, just argumentative. Here's what is happening. Jesus is not exposing her. He's understanding her. And what he's saying to her is this. I know you have a rough past. And you've been treated as property. You've been dismissed and discarded. 
And even now, the guy that you're with won't deliver you from poverty, but I see you, and I hear you. And even though I'm not even supposed to be talking to you right now, I am with you. And if you try to call this guy who won't commit to you, I know he's not going to show up, but I came all the way to Samaria to let you know that I am here with you right now. See, I think for us to win in this season, for us to learn how to come together in this season, we need to learn how to heal. The problem is we don't know how to heal. The only way for us to heal is to uncover the hurt in our lives. There's a difference between uncovering and exposing. We think as believers we're called to expose it. But Jesus is asking, just uncover it for me. I know what you've been through and I know the pain that you've had and I'm not going to dismiss you and silence your voice. I'm not going to tell you how to react. I'm not going to get angry at you for being angry. In fact, I understand that even if you called for help right now, they wouldn't come. But I want you to know, I hear you. And I see what you're going through. This is the first step of healing is that we can uncover the hurts in our lives. But it's not enough to uncover them. We have to offer them to God because he is the only one that can heal. That's what Jesus is doing, process of elimination. These guys have never been able to heal. These people in society you thought could answer your problems, they've never been able to heal. But here I am to offer them to me. But this woman has been through so much pain so much hatred that she only knows one way. And look at what she says in verse 19. She says, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Since you just read my mail, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. It sounds like she's trying to distract from what's really happening, but she is desperately looking for an answer. And she's looking for answers in the only places she knows where to look. You said that we should do this. We said that we should do that. Your party says that it should be this way. My party says that it should be this way. Your leader and politician, my leader and politician, and she does what she knows to do, which is to go to a two-party system to try to find answers. How can we heal this divide, Jesus? I'm in pain. You, just, you know what I'm going through now. You recognize. And so she begins to open up like many of us do when we finally feel understood or at least listened to. There's more to this story. There's more to her story. Maybe what you're judging as a problem is actually years of pain. And we end up dismissing hurt that just desperately needs to be healed. And I think if we're going to learn how to heal, we got to learn to seek the right strategy. And I think this woman is doing what we're doing in 2020, years and years later. Y'all say this and we say this, and which one is right? This party goes in this direction. This party is in that direction. Which one can... Bridge the gap and heal the divide. And Jesus answers so brilliantly, and I believe his answer is the same then as it is now. He looks at this woman, and he recognizes her. Look, in verse 21, he says, woman. I know that sounds a little offensive to you in 2020, but really what he's doing is he's recognizing her. And he says, believe me. Time is coming where you will worship the Father, not on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Even there, I know you're hearing it as right and wrong, but it's not what he's saying. Because what he's about to say is, there is coming a day and a time where true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And he's giving the divide. He says, Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. What he's saying is this, you worship in spirit, but no truth. Jews, we worship what we do know. We were given the law. We worship in truth, but no spirit. 
What is he saying? You're both wrong. He's correcting the Jews time and time again. He's not here to put down this woman. He's leveling the playing field saying, it's all corrupt. It's all wrong. But there's a different answer. There's more to the story, and it's standing in front of you. Look at what he says. Verse 23, yet a time is coming, and now has come, now has come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they're the kind of worshipers that God is seeking. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman says, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Here's what she's saying. One day, maybe, there's somebody that's going to come that's going to bridge the gap. But right now, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how to heal this divide. Our people hate each other. They won't understand each other. And Jesus, he looks at her. And he says in verse 26, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. You see, Jesus says healing is neither here nor there. It's not found in a party or a political system. It's found in a person. And I know that presently right now you are limited in your perspective, but I need you to know, woman, that there is more to this story and it's standing in front of you. I don't have all the answers, but I know the one who does. And I didn't come out here this morning to be eloquent and try to drop these lines that you could post later on social media to say, my pastor, man, he's so woke. He knows all this stuff. And he's got, I don't, I don't have the answers, but I know the one who does. And my job is to lead you straight to Jesus because here's the strategy for healing. It's found in the person of Jesus. The man who went through Samaria, preaching that this message is not just for those who think they have the answers or for those who think that they don't have access to the answers. The solution is in Christ. Here's why the answer is in Jesus. Because when I don't know how to speak to the pain of my black brothers and sisters, Jesus was lynched and whipped in the streets. He was beaten and he was bloodied. He was murdered in the most heinous way in front of all of humanity to see. He was disenfranchised. He was discarded. He was forsaken by his own people. And yet he died so that he could look at you and say, I know. And I, the one you're looking for, I am he. Jesus is the hope we have for the future because no matter what society we live in, no matter how Christian we might say it is, there's corruption and there's stuff that isn't right, but we're a part of a kingdom whose king sits on a throne, the book of Psalms says, whose foundation is righteousness and justice. He's not just a king that rules with power. He lowered himself to the place of death. He served so that he could look at us in the face and say, I know exactly where you've been. And now that I'm seated in authority and victory, I invite you to come and be seated with me. I want to read to you this last scripture. It's in Philippians 3, verse 20. It's a reminder for all of us that we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Might I remind you that you are a citizen of heaven and unity and healing can never come from a party or a political system. Healing is found in the person of Jesus. And he's here today with open arms wherever you're watching from, whatever your background is, I pray that you hear the heart of this message. And maybe there's more to the story. Maybe there's things that you don't see. But Jesus sees, and he knows your every cry. The Bible says he sees every tear. He puts them in a bottle, and he saves them because one day he's going to pour them out with justice and righteousness and mercy and grace. 
I want you to know that healing is found in Jesus. That's why we can come together, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, no matter what our culture is, as new men and women. The Bible says this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female, neither black nor white. What's he saying? Are there things that make us distinct? Of course. Are there things that make us diverse? Absolutely. Those things are beautiful and make us who God's created us created us to be, but be reminded they are secondary to who you are in Christ. You are a child of God. More than anything else, you are a child of the King. You matter. Your life matters. You are valuable. You are cherished. You are loved. You were worth dying for, and God gave His only Son so that you could know that no matter what you've been through, there's a God who loves you. I believe that that revelation will spark revival in our church. I believe that revelation can transform us so that we can truly exude the love of Christ to one another in this trying time. We gotta learn how to deal with our discomforts, how to learn how to listen, learn how to connect with one another and heal. But we gotta choose the right strategy for healing. Here's the strategy. Come to Jesus.